Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And a special welcome this morning to all of the moms watching us on the live stream. This is your day, and, uh, and we love you, moms. And, and this is obviously sort of a weird Mother's Day. What with the quarantine and social distancing still in effect, you know, I know this is probably not your typical Mother's Day, but our prayer is that you find joy and feel appreciated today. This is also oh, another weird Sunday for us as I stand here looking out at an empty sanctuary. And I want to take a minute this morning to talk about something that's been very much on our minds, and that is our plans for reopening the church for public worship. Ever since Governor Holcomb came out with his guidelines a little bit more than a week ago about reopening Indiana, we've been looking really, really carefully at that statement and trying to parse out exactly what that might mean for us in terms of pragmatically reopening ourselves for worship. A lot of those plans and precautions, we're still working on that plan. However, a couple of things uh, have come up in the meantime. Part of the decision for when we'd be doing uh, public worship again was made for us midweek when Bishop Tremble, the United Methodist Bishop for Indiana, made a statement, came out with a, a decision that United Methodist churches in Indiana should not open for public worship any sooner than June the 14th. Since he came out with that statement, we've been working really, really hard and are still working on putting a plan into place for exactly what that's going to look like. But what I can tell you right now is that uh, the plan subject to changes uh, as they come about, but the plan right now is that effective on June the 14th, we're going to be opening for public worship for two services at 9.30 and 11. We're going to be taking a lot of precautions with that, and things are going to look a little bit different when you do get back here. But uh, and you're going to be hearing more about what those precautions are going to be in the coming weeks. But one of the things we know now is that according to the governor's guidelines, those above the age of 65 or those who are at higher risk for infection should refrain from going to public worship until July the 4th. Well, that means that we're going to be taking that and a lot more precautions. Then on July the 5th, we're going to be back open for three services. Our live stream will continue indefinitely on into the future. But we're going to be having three services here uh, starting July the 5th, although some of the precautions and the changes that we're making to protect ourselves and one another, those will continue through the summer and even into the fall. As I say, we're meeting and we're thinking and we're talking right now about uh, how to do that responsibly. But already we know a couple things. And the first thing we know is that no plan is going to be perfect. And no plan is going to meet the needs of everyone within our congregation. Some of you hearing me talk about this probably are sitting there and thinking that this is a frustratingly slow ramp up to reopening. Others of you are sitting there and listening to this and thinking that we're moving way, way too fast. I get that. I get that, and I understand that. But please understand this. We care a lot about this. Dano and I and our staff and our church leadership who are meeting and talking and consulting with a lot of people on this, we care about respecting your rights to be able to make your decisions, but also we care about the general wel welfare of those in our congregation. We know that while this isn't going to satisfy any, everybody, and while there is no perfect plan, please know that we're coming up with a plan that we believe is going to be responsible and respectful. The other thing that we know for a fact is that we're going to need a lot of help when we do this, a lot of help. When we reopen on June the 14th, we're going to need a number of people to serve as uh, sort of extra ushers to help guide people through the precautions that we're taking. We need, we're going to need about three or four people per week to help disinfect the sanctuary between the services. Now, all of our volunteers will be provided with KN95 masks and gloves, so we're going to be taking care of your safety for that. But if you're below the age of 65 and would be willing to help us out during that, that critical time, please give the office a call because we would absolutely love to talk to you. You know, folks, 
It's been a long haul, and we're not quite to the end of it yet. But the good news is every step along the way, every frustration and every joy that we have faced, God has walked with us. We love you as a congregation. We're so grateful for the loyalty and how true you have been. We're going to ask for a couple of other things. We're going to ask for your patience as we continue to work hard towards a, a responsible plan. And we also covet your prayers. Please pray for us as we make the decisions moving forward. But God will continue to walk with us as he has every step along the way. And God will continue to bring us back together towards that day when we can assume the new normal that we're going to be entering into. We are grateful for that, and we're grateful for you. And the next little bit of our time as we worship together, let's walk with the God who walks with us. Let's worship. I pray you'll be our eyes and watch us where we go.
Good morning. Today is a very special day for so many. Thank you for taking the time to worship and join with us this morning on our live stream. First of all, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of you wonderful and incredible women who have the job of caring for, loving, teaching, and nurturing selflessly. Throughout the year, and especially during this time, you have one of the most stressful and difficult jobs in the world. However, it is also one of the most fulfilling, incredible, and special jobs that there is in this world. As a son, I want to take advantage of this opportunity to thank my mom for all that she has done for me and for my siblings throughout our life. I love you and I can't thank you enough for all that you've done for me and for our family. As a part of this church family, I want to thank all of the moms of our church. I am extremely grateful to you for all that you do for our families, for your families. And I speak for so many of our church members that we all love you and pray for you this day as we celebrate you. Happy Mother's Day. Everyone at home sitting with their mothers, I urge you in this moment to show your mom how thankful you are for their guidance, for their love, for their support, and at times, patience. Happy Mother's Day from the bottom of my heart to all who have been a mother in any way. If you have any joys or concerns today that you'd like, that you'd wish to share with us, please add those prayers to our chat on our live stream. We do have someone monitoring the chat, and we will add those prayers, those things to our prayer chain for the week. And as a church, we ask that you continue to keep those in your prayers throughout the week. As you're looking at the chat, please also include those requests in your silent prayers this morning. We are here for you, and we want to know what's going on in, uh, inside of our church family in your lives. We're in this together, and we want to be prayer warriors for you and with you. Let's pray. Father, on this day when we celebrate mothers, we want to thank you for all the moms everywhere, everything that they do, everything that they sacrifice, and the ways that they love, care, and teach each and every one of us. Lord, please help them to know today just how loved they are and how special they are to us. Father, this is still a confusing time for every one of us. Help us to look to you and keep you in our hearts and in our minds always. Help our focus not to be the things of this world, but help us to keep our focus on you. Thank you for our first responders all over the world who are serving and loving your people. Be with them as they continue to fight for us, as they continue to protect us here in our community and the communities all over the world. Lord, be with our service men and women, the ones who serve to protect us and give us the opportunity to worship freely this morning. I pray that you be with the health care providers as they serve on the front lines of this pandemic, as they serve to protect us and to keep us healthy. Lord, help these people to see you in the midst of their service. Lord, I pray that you be at the center of our leadership, the leadership of our government, the leadership of our church, the leadership of our families. Lord, I pray that as they make decisions, you be the voice that they hear and you be the light that shines throughout this world. Lord, be with our church family here. I pray that you continue to walk with us throughout our lives and help us to cling to you in the good times and in the bad. I pray that as our journey continues, you be the light that shines the brightest and you be the voice that guides us. Father, we love you and we thank you for all the blessings that you continue to share with us. Help us to see your will and help us to follow your path Today, as we come to you from our homes or wherever we are worshiping this morning, hear our prayers as we lift them up to you silently now. Lord, lead us this morning in the prayer that you taught your disciples so many years ago when you said, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Two men bring an offering to the Lord, one of the fruit of the ground, the other the firstborn of his flock. God accepts one and rejects the other. Why? Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. The word tells us clearly that the offering Abel brought was the firstborn of his flock. But it doesn't say that Cain brought the first fruits of his crops. It simply says, in the process of time, Cain brought an offering. Cain harvested his crops and over time gathered enough to bring an offering. It was an offering on Cain's terms. God accepted Abel's offering because it was the first of his increase. Cain's offering was rejected because it wasn't the first of his. Giving the first to God requires faith. When a firstborn lamb is born in a flock, it's not possible to know how many more lambs that you might produce. But Abel gave his firstborn lamb in faith, whereas Cain made sure he had enough for himself before giving to God. Many of us treat God the same way as Cain, making sure we have enough money before we see if there's anything left for God. Even if we give from what's left over, God can't accept the offering because it's not the first fruit. Other stories emphasize this truth. In the account of the fall of Jericho, the Lord gave strict instructions that the Israelites were not to keep any of the spoils from Jericho. All of it belonged to him, the Lord declared. Jericho belonged to the Lord because it was the first city conquered in the Promised Land. It was the first fruits. God withheld his blessing from Israel when one man took some of the spoils for himself. The first belongs to God. There was much more at stake than money when Abraham offered his firstborn son Isaac. When God asked for his son, Abraham didn't wait to have ten sons before giving Isaac. He gave the first when he only had one to give. Abraham had only the promise of having more sons. It took faith for Abraham to offer Isaac, faith that God respected and blessed. And God did the same for us. He gave his first in the form of his son, his first and only begotten son, who was given to us while we were still sinners. God gave Jesus in faith that we might one day give our lives to him. The gift of his Son came before the blessing of our repentance and salvation. We give our first fruits in much the same way. Before we see the blessing of God, we give it in faith. Giving the first fruits of your income says to God, I recognize you first. I am putting you first in my life, and I trust you to take care of the rest. We are so grateful for the blessings that you have continued to shower upon us throughout the year. Even in the midst of this chaos and this unknown, God has continued to be faithful to us, and so have each and every one of you. We thank you for worshiping with us throughout the weeks and for being a part of this incredible family that we have here at First UMC Crown Point. I hope that we continue, that you continue to enjoy our live stream here and that our streams continue to bless each and every one of you as they also bless our Creator. This is our time of offering, but offering to this place is so much more than providing money for our bills. It's about our hearts. It's about our service to God. In this place, in this church, we have continued to serve and to love people of our community. And we hope that through all of this, we have continued to build the kingdom of God. 
We can't thank you enough for being a part of that. Continue to look for opportunities to serve and to love people. In the midst of trials, there is nothing greater than the love that we can share with one another. Love for families, love for each other, and love for God. Today, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to give back, I pray that you open your hearts and you open your minds to the needs of others and continue to look for ways to serve in your neighborhoods or in your communities. The best way that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ is through service and through showing his love to others. God has continued to bless us. God has given us blessing upon blessing, and this is our opportunity to give back the first fruits of what God has blessed us with. There are many ways to give this morning or throughout the week. We can't keep this place moving in the direction of God without your help. Please consider utilizing one of the three ways to support this place and to support our communities. Throughout the week, you can always give by dropping your offering off here during the hours of 8.30 and 4.30. You can visit our online giving portal by going to our website at fumccp.org and just click on the Click to Give Now button on the left side of the page. Or simply text your offering by messaging F-U-M-C-C-P to 45777. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued support and your prayers of this place in the, and this world. God is bigger than anything that we will ever go through. And your faithfulness and your love for this place is incredible. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your support and your hand as you walk with us through this time. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness and your guidance in the midst of these trying times. We continue to look to you and continue to be in awe of your compassion and your grace. Lord, in the wake of Easter, you have risen out of death and shown us your grace and your love and what that means for each and every one of us. Today, as we give back, we ask that you be at the center of our decisions and our mission here at First UMC. Help us to see how you want us to serve and how you want us to steward your people and the ministries that we are all a part of. Lord, help us to see the opportunities that you are calling us towards and to utilize our gifts and our offerings to do your will. Lord, we look to you in this moment, asking you to take our gifts and to take our offerings and use them to glorify your name and to build your kingdom in this place, in this world. Lord, not our will, but your will be done in this place. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your blessings. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. Scripture reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 22. It says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody, and a special happy Mother's Day to all the moms with us today. It's appropriate that today I'm starting off the sermon not in the sanctuary again, but on location in one of the scariest places that any parent could ever have to visit. I'm in a kid's messy playroom. This is truly a place that could strike fear into the heart of any parent. 
Speaking of fear, that bear is staring at me. I'm just saying, am I the only one that creeps me out just, just a little bit? But anyway, the reality is, as parents, we spend an awful lot of time in a place just like this. You take even a well-mannered kid, even an orderly kid, if any kid is ever truly orderly, and you let them loose in a clean room for five minutes and they become an engine of destruction. They could reduce order to disorder quicker than anybody could have thought. And sooner or later as parents we're all confronted with a room sort of like this. And you know that when you see that there's several things you can do. You could try to ignore it at least for a while. You could try to get the kids to remedy the situation but inevitably you're going to have to open the door, come in with your kid, and enter into the mess. I think God gets that. As a matter of fact, that's the whole point of what he came to do in Jesus. In Jesus, God comes to enter into our messiness. God comes to enter into the crazy of our lives and to inhabit that time and space with us. Just lately we've been reminded very forcefully of just how disorderly and messy life can be. With the current crisis, we've been reminded of how things can go from order to disorder fairly quickly. The good news is Christ has come and Christ sits with us even in the messiness of life, even in the disorder. Christ enters into a scary world and into a scary mess of our lives. And with his love, he sits with us and works with us to redeem that situation. That's good news for a scary world and a scary mess, sort of like this. I told you there was something wrong with that bear. Good morning, everybody, and once more, welcome, and a special welcome again to the moms on Mother's Day. This is a real special day for us. This obviously is a little bit different of Mother's Day, but our love and appreciation is absolutely no less whatsoever. This is the day when we pause for just a second and celebrate the moms, or maybe just, not simply the moms, but the grandmas, or the aunts, or the uncles, or the friends, when we look back and we say thanks to God for all of those people who have invested their lives in our lives. When God wants to create a life, I think he does that by the people that he surrounds that life with. And probably today for you, you can look back at your life and see a mom or see a mentor or see somebody that God put into your life that was showing you God's love in a way that you didn't even realize in that moment. I'm talking about the people who have blessed us and the people who have formed us. Just maybe today, you and I are the sum product of all the people that God has put into our lives to form that life like a lump of clay and, and to make us who we are today. And it's appropriate and special that we pause for just a second and to say thanks for those, those folks. Truth is, we think about parenting in terms of what happens in moments like the, this. You think about it in terms of the hallmark moments, especially the further you get from having your children around you all the time. If, you, if your children have grown up, if they're on their way into life, you look back and what you remember about parenting are those moments when they made you proud, those moments when they, they gave you that hug, the warm, fuzzy kind of lovely moments. But the reality is, Real parenting is always something that takes place in the trenches. As you are living it out as a parent, a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa or just a mentor or a friend, 
where your influence is, is greatest are the moments when life gets incredibly messy. Every parent does not simply become a parent the moment that they uh, give birth to a child. Parents become parents in the trenches of life, in places that look an awful lot like this, those messy rooms. Parenting becomes parenting when your children come home crying because their life is a mess or because they've messed up or because they've failed or their room looks like a total mess. That's when the rubber meets the road in terms of parenting, right? And what we do in those moments, what we do in those moments of mess, whether it be the mess of a room or the mess of a life or the mess of a messed up relationship, whatever it is, what we do in those moments counts a lot more in terms of what God asks of us as parents than all of the good times. Inevitably, true parenting doesn't just happen in the warm, fuzzy moments. The reality is parenting takes place in the messes of life. And the messier life gets... The more we have messed up or our children have messed up, the more important it is. Those are the critical moments when God wants to use us as true parents. And every parent knows that children are experts at creating messes, right? Oh, I know, I know. When I say that, someone's going to say, not my child. My child, they were immaculate. You know what? My child loves order. If that is true, if that child really exists, that's also a child who loves eating their vegetables and does their homework all the time without question and asks permission to take out the garbage, which is to say a cyborg and not a real kid. But if you encounter a real kid that's like that, please do all of us a favor, capture them, Capture them, keep them alive. Science wants to study them and see if they could reproduce you know, them in a, in a lab situation. But no real air-breathing kid is like that. Instead, kids are engines for messes. You can have a room that is absolutely immaculate. Put a kid in that room for 10 minutes, walk in, and it looks like a bomb went off, Right? You know, they're engines for destruction at that moment. Put two six-year-old boys in a room, they can have those walls down to bare studs in about two and a half minutes. It's absolutely a part of who they are. And when they do, as a parent, some of you know this, some of you have been parents a lot longer than I have, you know there's several things that you can do. One option is just to close the door and walk away disgusted, walk away grumbling, right? Right? You know that, that you say, you know, that's just not worth it. I'm just walking away. I'm going to try to ignore it and pretend that there's nothing beyond that door. The other option, and sadly we've all done this, you've had enough, you've been bottling it up enough, the frustration is there, and you end up yelling at your kids and trying to make them feel guilty as though that guilt is going to modify their character or their behavior. Okay, and maybe sometimes I guess that it might, but the only downside is in the process it kills the relationship. That you become as a parent simply that person associated with guilt and negativity. You can grit your teeth and do it yourself, right? Now the advantage to this is you get to feel like a martyr when you do. Because you know what I'm talking about. The whole time you're in your kid's room cleaning it up, you're saying, I'm going to do this because somebody's got to do this and nobody around here cares enough to do this. And if I don't do this, it's never going to get done. Now, the advantage is for this that you end up with a clean room. The, The disadvantage is it does nothing for your children. Or the other option, and parents know this, is you can enter into that mess. You can take your child by the hand, walk with them into that messy room, sit with them in the midst of that mess, and say, now, let's bring order to this. Let's bring order to this together. The advantage to that, well, the disadvantage is it takes a lot longer. 
The advantage is it renews the character of your child. And in the process, it renews your relationship with that child. We have the option to sit with them in the midst of their mess and to begin to work with them to bring disorder into order in their room and in their life. As a parent, which one of those options you choose really depends on your goal. If your goal is a clean room, well, walking away or yelling at your kids or doing it yourself, that'll result, well, at least it won't be a problem anymore. But if your goal is not a clean room but a redeemed child, then the only option left is to enter in with them. Because entering in with them forms their character. And it forms your relationship with that child. God gets that. Because his kids are experts at creating messes too. Very few of us are further along in that process than we were when we were 12 years old. Which is to say, all of us are experts at creating the messes in our lives. Oh, we may try to ignore it. We may try to shut the door and walk away. We may try to pretend that there's no mess on the other side of that door, but we know deep down it's there all the time, and it's true of all of us. Think for just a second uh, about the most together person you know, the person whose life seems like everything is together and everybody loves everybody, and man, they've made it, they're a success. If you were going to talk to them and if they were going to be honest enough, they would say, there's this door in my life there's a door in my life, and if you dared to open that door, you would see anarchy on the other side of the door. All of us encounter that all the way through our lives. Now, Paul talked about that, and I actually, this is one of my favorite scriptures because this is so real. I love what Paul says here. In describing himself, he's describing us, and he says, I don't get me. I don't get me. Because the great stuff that I want to do, I don't do that. And the terrible stuff that I don't want to do, I don't know. Somehow that's what I end up doing. I just don't understand. Now this, this is sort of the corollary to something that you've experienced. And if you've been a parent or a friend or a mentor or a babysitter, whatever it is, you know this. Because you walk into a kid's room and five minutes ago this room was in complete uh, order. You walk in, there's underwear hanging from the ceiling fan, you know? And the couch is on its side. And the pictures are, are, are sideways. And you look at this kid and you say, what happened? What happened? Why would you do this? And I'll bet every parent knows what the answer is going to be, right? You know exactly. You can fill in the blanks. The kid looks at you and says, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You were the only one in here. You know, were, did gypsies invade? What happened? What do you mean you don't know? The truth is that they are being honest in that moment. They really don't know. I didn't walk in here to create this. It wasn't a part of the plan. This wasn't on my to-do list. I just was me in here and all of this stuff happens. Well, guess what, folks? We carry that into our adulthood too. It takes different forms, but sooner or later in life you find yourself somewhere and you open your eyes and there is this mess around you. And you say, how did this happen? I didn't mean to get into this financial mess. I didn't need to, mean to kill this relationship. I didn't mean to hurt people I loved. I didn't mean to, to uh, do the, mess up this job that I liked. I didn't mean to squander this, act, this opportunity, whatever it is. And you say, how in the world did I get here? And it's a part of human nature. God understands that. Because God looks down at us, he says, I created you for perfection. I created you and put you in this beautiful, orderly world. And I wanted to order all of your relationships, and I wanted to order the priorities in your life, and you messed it up. We walked away from God. And when we walk away from God, we go from order to disorder in our world, 
And we go from order to disorder in our lives and in our relationships and our marriages, in our parenting, in our jobs, in every aspect of our lives. And all of a sudden, the messes, the messes crop up. That's what happened. And the truth of the matter is, long ago, God could have closed the door and walked away. God could have been excused for just saying, you know what, I tried this, they messed up, I gave them nothing but love, I gave them everything they needed, they turned away from me, forget about it, good luck, you're on your own. God could have closed that door and walked away. God could have yelled at us so we'd feel guilty. And actually that's kind of the, the idea of a God that some of us still carry with us. This God who's all about, this is what you're doing wrong, and when I encounter God, he's all about, you know, this is where you messed up, and this is where you need to do better, and it's loading up the guilt, and it's loading up the the negativity until God becomes something fearsome. No wonder people walk away from that kind of a God, if that's your idea of God. God could have made it all go away. Now, I need to spend a minute here unpacking that one, because that's a question you hear. Why couldn't God just make, take all of the negative things in the world and just, just fix them, you know? Why couldn't God have just waved his magic God wand and everything wrong in the world just disappears? And usually when that question is asked, there's pain behind that question. It's because we're looking at something negative in our lives. We're saying, God, why couldn't you just fix absolutely everything? And that's a real, that's, that's a whole sermon series in and of itself. But the truth of the matter is, I don't believe in a God who ever creates the negative things in his life, in our lives and in our world. But why doesn't he just fix it? I think it's because God doesn't love the world, God loves us. And if God simply came in and fixed all the symptoms, we would still be unredeemed. God never ever wills the use, uh, the negative things in our lives. But God redeems us, wants to redeem us in the midst of that. God wants to enter into those messes. And sometimes it's only when we open our eyes and see the messes of our lives that we're drawn to ask for that, that we're willing to open the door and invite somebody in. Most of you know, I, th- I think, if you've heard me at all, that Jane and I have uh, one daughter, Abigail, who's, who's grown up as a family of her own now. But as a kid, Abby was probably no messier than other kids, but she was certainly no less. And there were moments in our household where there was this tension about the condition of her room, you know? And, but still, it was at least somewhat manageable. And then she graduated from high school, and then she went to Notre Dame for her first uh, semester there. And, and, and I just have this feeling that messiness kind of rose to a new level. Maybe some of us remember that the first time we're away from home. Well, the, after that first semester, Abby didn't have a car there. And so Jane and I were going to drive to Notre Dame right after her last final of Christmas break and, and take her home for Christmas break, and I couldn't wait. And Abby called me that morning, and she said, Dad, when you get here, I have a favor to ask of you. I said, sure, what do you need? She said, well... You lived in a dorm, right? I said, yeah. She said, you lived in a fraternity, right? I said, yeah. She said, so you know about dorm room funk. And I went, "Uh uh-oh. I said, what do you mean dorm room funk? She said, well, Dad, there's this smell. There's this smell in our dorm room. And and it's been here for a little bit. (coughs) Excuse me. And we kind of smelled around. We can't figure out where this smell is coming from. So as an expert, when you come here, would you smell out the dorm room funk and, and figure out where this is coming from? I said, how long has this been here? She said, all semester, but it's getting worse all the time, okay? And I said, we'll take care of it. So we got there that day. As soon as you opened the door, yeah, there was definitely this dorm room funk, Okay. But I am blessed with with a wife who, in addition to all of her other great characteristics, is an expert smeller, okay? Jane has a sense of smell that I can't even compete with. So as I'm kind of picking around the mess of this room, Jane is smelling all around, and she got over to the radiator, okay, an old-fashioned radiator in this room, and she said, Mark, come over here. 
And wedged down between the wall and that hot radiator, there was something. Later investigations sort of hinted that it may at one point have been a cheese sandwich, okay? We don't know how old it was, but at that point it had grown kind of fuzz and fur, and I think it was on its way to growing fangs and legs, all right? And, and, and we had to reach down behind this and get this object and throw it away. Now, here's the point of this. Here's the point. That smell had been there for weeks, but it wasn't until the smell got bad enough it wasn't until the mess was an assault to the, to the nostrils that she was willing to reach out and be able to open up and invite us to come in to begin to sort out that sense. Sort out that mess. That's how God uses the messes in our lives. It's when we have the courage to open up our lives and see the messes that God, that's when we're willing to open up the door to God and to invite him in. And in Christ, that's exactly what God does. God chooses to enter into our mess and the craziness of life. God could have walked away, God could have condemned, he could have waved his mighty finger at us and resorted to guilt, but instead in Christ, God enters into our mess and sits with us in that mess. Paul says, Jesus who knew no sin was made to be sin. That means Christ didn't come simply to inhabit the mess of our lives, but to enter into that mess, to be a part of that mess. To sit with us in the messes of our lives and to work to redeem us, us in the midst of that mess. See, I've said this so often before, but when I, when I have the courage to see the messes in my life, I pray to God circumstantially. God, here is this problem. Fix this problem, God. Here is this, this thing that needs resolution. And God says, you know what? I want to work on your character. I want to work on your heart right there in the midst of that. And in the process to work on our relationship. Because the more you lean on me, the, more, the closer you're going to be to who I created you to be. Sometimes, oddly, it's the very messes of our lives where we learn and God forms us as a parent. And it's as we sit in that room with God and begin slowly to work on the mess around us that our relationship is formed. Make no mistake, God wants to work in your marriage. God wants to work in your job. God wants to work in your family and in your finances and in all of that stuff. God cares about the circumstances of your life. But primarily, God wants to work on our hearts in the midst of those messes. Because that's how relationships are formed. And that's how our character and our spirit is formed. In order that we can be sent out to enter in, to the messiness of a broken world. That's how that scripture ends. We are sent as ambassadors. Once God is set, set with us in our mess, then he sends us out there into the world, not insulated from the world, not protected from the world, but to enter into the messiness of this world with his love and his hope. But it begins with us. It begins with our willingness to be able to be honest enough to see what that mess is. Your homework this week, if you have the kind of courage, is to be able to pray that we see our lives through God's eyes. Because when I see my life through my eyes, it's okay. I can shut the door. I can, go nose, I can go nose deaf to the, to the smell, okay? I can try to pretend but have the courage to ask, God, help me to see. Help me to see my life through your eyes. Help me to see where that mess is. And then have the courage to say, God, would you sit with me in this mess? 
God, would you sit with me in this mess and redeem the mess, but redeem me in the mess? And you know what? Sometimes it just feels overwhelming. Sometimes there, we reach those points in life where it feels like the mess is just so huge, we can't even begin to approach it. But you know what? If you've ever sat with a kid in a messy room, you know what to do. You know that a good parent doesn't start with the whole mess. It starts with one book. So you know what? Let's put this one book back. So this week, just find one mess. And the thing of it is, as we do that, when you sat with your child in their mess and, and, and you helped to redeem that, you were redeeming that child. And you were redeeming that relationship and you were forming that relationship. Because it's as we sit together or walk together or ride together in those messes that our relationships are formed. You know, for all of those times, and I think Jane probably did it more than me, but for all those times I sat with Abby cleaning up, she paid me back. She paid me back in so many ways with this rich relationship that I absolutely love. But I remember one time where she redeemed me in the midst of a mess. And it came actually my very first week here, 14 years ago coming up. You believe they put up with me for 14 years, John? Jeez. Anyway, 14 years ago, and that, when I, the very first week that I moved into this church, and it was a weird year for us because Abby had just graduated from high school, so this was our last summer home with, with Abby before she went away to college, and, and we were moving, you know, and I was kind of getting used to a new church and trying to do all of that. And on top of that, the year before, I had signed a contract to help to contribute to a book okay? And it was a book about Indiana and some history in Indiana, and I was assigned 14 places around the state, and I had to research those places and kind of tell the stories of those places. And, and, and this on top of moving, on top of graduation, on top of everything else, it was just a real stressful time. So as we were packing up, the, the, I should say the deadline for this book, the manuscript, was the week that we moved. So as we were packing up, I was working late nights trying to get this done. And before we moved, I sent in that manuscript. I said, yes, that's done. That's one thing off the plate. And then my first week here, the publisher called, said, we got the manuscript. I said, that's great. They said, where are the pictures? I said, what pictures? They said, didn't you read your contract that you signed? You messed up. You didn't read the contract. Because you owe us an original picture for every place that you have uh, taken that picture of, and we need it in five days. Now, there's 14 places across the whole length and breadth of Indiana. And I look back at the contract, sure enough, I didn't read that part. I'd messed up. And now it was coming at a really critical time. So I went home and I told Jane, I've messed up. I messed this thing up, and now I got to make it good. I got to fix my own mess, okay? But I didn't have the time to take three or four days to do this. We, we, we got a map, and I put dots, okay? I put dots where all the places in Indiana I needed to go and take pictures at, okay? And then I began to draw lines. And by the time I was done, it looked like a toddler had gone nuts with a marker because it was literally zigzagging all across the state. And I said, I don't have three days to do this. Here's the only way I can do this. I need to leave the house at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, and if I do it right, I will get to the place, first place I need to take a picture, just about dawn. And if I keep zigzagging across and following this path, it was something like six or 700 miles, I said I could be at the last place where I need to take a picture just about sunset. And I can take that picture, it was in southern Indiana, and I could drive back that night. Jane said, you're crazy. I said, I know, but I've messed up. There's nothing else I can do. So the night before this long journey that I was dreading so badly, undoing my mess, we had dinner and I went to sit on the front porch and my daughter came to sit on the front porch and she looked at me and she said, well, old man, what time do we leave tomorrow? And I said, we? What are you talking about, we? She said, I've taken the day off tomorrow and I'm going to go. I'm going to go with you. I said, you know what? Those are going to be incredibly long, hard hours in the car. I am the one who has messed this thing up. I need to be the one to make it right. And she said, yeah, maybe. But I want to go along with you when you do. 
And that morning we left at 3 o'clock in the morning. We were on the road 20 hours in one day. And the situation was resolved. The mess was redeemed. But so much more. During those 20 hours, a relationship with my kid that was already great got even deeper. Got even deeper because we had the chance to be able to build on that relationship. And in some way, I guess she was redeeming the mess that I made, but more than that, she was redeeming me in that process. Here's the thing. Right now, somewhere in your life, there's a mess. If you're anything like most of us. If we have the courage to look at it, somewhere there's that door that if you open it, on the other side, there's going to be a huge mess. But if you have the courage to look into that mess and to invite the God of creation into that mess, what you're going to find out is this isn't a God who's going to shrug and walk away. This isn't a God who's going to turn and yell and be a God of anger and judgment on that mess. This is a God who's going to enter into that mess and sit with you or walk with you or ride with you and in the process redeem you and redeem your relationship with him. Let's have the courage this week to ask God to help us see our lives through his eyes. And when we see that mess, let's have the guts to ask to open up that door and enter into that mess with the God who enters in, the divine parent, who will enter in with you and maybe redeem that mess, but more than that, redeem us in that mess. Let's walk in even into the mess with the God who has promised to walk with us. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being with us today. We sure appreciate it. And one more time, happy Mother's Day to all the moms watching us today. We're grateful for you. And now we go back into life. We go back into the days that make up that life. My prayer for you this week is that you find a time of blessing and renewal. But if you have the courage to see it, you might just see a mess or two along the way. And when you do, my prayer is that you can have the courage to open that door and to enter into the mess with the God who wants to walk with us, a God who does nothing more than loves you, that we may be renewed and that we may be formed by that relationship. 
in the name of Christ, let's walk on with the one who walks on with us. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks.